you know, I don't view myself as just a lawyer as well. When there's an opportunity to either connect a client with another client or connect a client with a different type of business opportunity that really has nothing to do with the practice of law, I do it. Even if I'm not billing for it, it doesn't matter because the clients are going to appreciate that. And there's nothing better than a referral from a happy client. Because when a, when a happy client says to somebody else, Darren, Alan, Heitner Legal did a great job for me, what, what, what more can I ask for? I'm Jack Newton, CEO of Clio, and this is the Daily Matters Podcast. On Daily Matters, we talk with legal professionals, industry leaders, and subject matter experts about the future of law. We explore where the legal industry is headed, how legal practice is changing, and what you can be doing to position yourself for success. This episode of Daily Matters is brought to you by the 2020 Clio Cloud Conference, the world's best legal conference, which is going completely virtual for the first time ever. Get your pass now at cliocloudconference.com. Today's guest is Darren Heitner, founder and chief vision officer at Heitner Legal PLLC, which is a law firm with many practice areas, including sports law and contract law. Darren's also an accomplished writer on sports law and business topics, and he's the author of the book, how to play the game, what every sports attorney needs to know. Darren, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So Darren, first of all, would love to talk a little bit about sports in the era of COVID, which is certainly an interesting time and feels like there's new events and uh, turning points every single day. Uh, With major professional sports leagues that are trying to pull off uh, starting a season or restarting a season in the midst of COVID-19, can you tell us a little bit about what you see happening on the ground? Do you think we're going to see teams starting to play games again in, in July and August? Um, and would love to hear any uh, inside baseball, so to speak, in terms of what you've seen happening uh, inside of some of these discussions. I love that you say inside baseball, because as we're taping this, actually this evening, there's going to be the first games of a regular shortened season in Major League Baseball. So to answer your question succinctly, absolutely are we going to see live professional games on our televisions. And I know people, consumers cannot wait for that. Also the players and the agents that survive based on the commissions from those contracts are very excited for it. And in fact, we've already seen a bit of success on a limited basis with regard to professional sports coming back into play. Major League Soccer is operating within a bubble in at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida where nobody can come in or go outside of that bubble. And in the limited amount of time that Major League Soccer has been performing its games, and I think most teams have played roughly five games thus far, we've now seen multiple occurrences where there's COVID-19 testing and zero cases of positive results within that bubble. So if we're going to use Major League Soccer as a case study, they're doing an excellent job. Meanwhile, you have the National Basketball Association, the NBA, ramping up to resume its season that was cut short prior and that was at one point in time indefinitely suspended. That will also take place within a a quote unquote bubble at Walt Disney World in Orlando. And the most recent test of all the players in that bubble, because they're right now they're just training, again, zero positive results. So we're seeing success in these bubble ecosystems. The real question is, will this also work outside of a bubble? Will it work with Major League Baseball, which again is just about to start? And more importantly, will it work with the National Football League, where you have 53 men on every roster, there is a very big difficulty in trying to limit the spread, and they simply cannot operate within a bubble. We've seen teams the vast majority of them already say that there will either be zero fans or a limited number of fans in the stadiums. Right now, there's only four teams that have not said anything on that subject. There are still a lot of unknowns, at least with the National Football League, and players, especially rookies, are just starting to report to training camp now. Preseason games are off. The league and the players have already negotiated to remove all four preseason games. So we're simply talking about regular season games, a 17 week schedule with 16 regular season games per team. And while I do expect the NFL season to go to get underway, I'm not completely optimistic 
that we will see a full season because I do fear that there will be some spread and perhaps significant spread of COVID-19 throughout the players. And, and given the approach that you're, the various approaches you're seeing and, and with the NHL, uh, we've, we've seen host cities be established. Which of these approaches do you feel is most likely to, to see success and, and be sustainable through the, the course of the crisis? Absolutely the bubble scenario where people are completely limited from getting inside the bubble and going outside the bubble. And with constant testing and, and just supervising the entire situation. And you mentioned the NHL with host cities. That I think is also uh, has, has been proven to be a very solid solution thus far. And hopefully it's not one that is only temporary and actually will last the entire season for NHL. Uh, again, it's a logistical issue. While the NBA with a limited number of teams, it's not every single team, uh, performing a small set of games before the playoffs. And there's discussion right now as to whether or not there will be an expanded playoffs. And Major League Soccer, which there are some teams that aren't even part of the bubble because they were having a crisis within their own franchises concerning the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we just don't know how it's going to work out with Major League Baseball and with the NFL. And we have seen a very large decrease in positive tests with Major League Baseball and immediately quarantining those players. The fear with the National Football League, and we haven't even discussed college sports, including college football, is we keep hearing about all these positive tests. And these individuals are not necessarily socially distancing, and it's really hard for them to do so. They need to prepare and train their bodies for the rigorous uh, type of activity that is just a part of their sport. And so, again, if, if it was possible, it would be great to have these teams participate in the bubble. But from everything that I've heard, it's just not on the table. And for our listeners that might be unfamiliar with this bubble concept, can you explain exactly how that works? Who's included in the bubble? And, and is, is there different implementations of, of this bubble approach? Uh, it is a very strict approach where uh, players are a part of that bubble. Coaches are part of that bubble, team personnel, and interestingly, only a select few media members. Media members cannot go inside or outside. So, for instance, what's happening at Walt Disney World is certain uh, hotels have been set aside for specific teams and media members, and they're, in essence, trapped there for the duration of the season. Uh, one player in particular was recently reprimanded and, and had to quarantine himself because he just barely went off the premises and there was a concern and I believe it was just to pick up uh, takeout food, delivery food. Wow. And there was such a concern that this bubble not be broken. I mean, literally think of it as being trapped in an actual bubble. That's, that's the premise. And so they're, they don't want any outliers. They, will, they, will, they don't want any potential for somebody else that they had not been able to test frequently to come inside of that or for somebody inside the bubble to go out of it, potentially pick up the, the virus and then spread it. Because obviously, when you're engaging in a bubble, if in fact the virus does come in, it could enhance the capacity of it spreading easier. So you need to control for that specific instance. And uh, again, thus far, we don't have much time to look at, but for the time that the bubbles have been in place for the NBA and MLS, it's been effective. How do players' families factor into this bubble approach? It's difficult, obviously. Uh, you know, I guess families are somewhat accustomed for the lifestyle of a professional athlete. That's especially true in, in Major League Baseball, where typically there's a 162-game season, um, and that's just regular season, and players are just constantly on the road. And also true for NBA players who are playing in excess of 82 games or 80 games in a regular season. Uh, so it's difficult, obviously, for players, especially players who may have family members who are pregnant or maybe suffering from COVID-19 or a different type of disease or have family members um, that, you know, that just have issues that, that need to be dealt with. 
and they can't be around for that. And we've, we have seen certain circumstances where players, uh, particularly, uh, I would say, veteran players who have amassed a large amount of money throughout their careers and hopefully have protected that, decide that it's simply not worth it to participate in a shortened season or the resumption of the NBA season. So we have seen uh, some players in Major League Baseball and in the NBA decide that they're simply just not going to take part in this season and they'll forfeit whatever monies uh, are, are associated with that forfeiture. Do you think any of these leagues will be able to actually complete a season without stopping due to COVID-19? Well, I do think the NBA will be able to complete its season. Again, we're only talking about uh, a little bit more than a handful of games per team to then figure out who will make the playoffs. And I do think that uh, the NBA has done a very strong job in, in neutralizing any threat. So I think NBA, MLS, absolutely. Now, with Major League Baseball, we're talking about a, a, a much shortened season. More than half uh, of the games that would normally be played have been erased. And I, it's, it's an unknown. I mean, take the Toronto Blue Jays, for instance. We don't even know where the Toronto Blue Jays are going to be playing their home games because the Canadian right. government has said that the team is not permitted to participate in home games at its normal stadium in Toronto. And there were questions about whether or not the team would play home games in Pittsburgh. I believe recently that's been stricken as well. So the team's in limbo. I mean, if, if you don't have a place for them to play, and I'm sure they'll come to some resolution, whether it be a minor league uh, facility or otherwise. But, you know, the bigger obvious issue is if we start seeing spread, if we start seeing players that are actually contracting the virus in the middle of the season, spreading it, uh, an inability to quarantine the players fast enough, uh, and perhaps especially if we start seeing uh, devastating effects of the virus. And I'm on the record elsewhere saying my biggest concern is actually in the NFL. And it's specifically with offensive and defensive linemen. So you think about NBA players, uh, largely Major League Baseball players, MLS players, they are mostly, and I'm generalizing here, extremely physically fit. And while you technically need to be fit to play in the NFL, there are subjective ideas as to what fit is. And I think if a lot of these offensive linemen and defensive linemen who are in excess of 300 pounds went to a normal doctor, that doctor would say, you're obese. And so if these individuals who are lined up right on top of each other and are looking at each other, offensive and defensive line, breathing on each other, sweating on each other, potentially bleeding on each other, if one of them contracts the virus, how easily will it be spread? And now are we not only worrying about having the virus and spreading it to others, but potentially the devastating effects of having the virus because these are individuals who may be predisposed to having very severe conditions arising from it. So on the topic of representing athletes for, for the professional athletes you, you work with, what are some of the considerations you're, you're seeing come up as it relates to COVID-19 and how are you helping guide them through some of those issues? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I, it largely varies on, on for, whether it's fortunate or not, the socioeconomic status of the player. When we're talking about individuals who are just about to become rookies or are on minimum salary contracts or are in the midst of their rookie contracts, they are individuals who don't necessarily have the economic freedom that others have to make a decision as to whether or not it's worthwhile to play. And let's not be naive. Economics are almost always a factor in these types of considerations. While health should always be the first priority, it's not necessarily always top of mind. And so those are certain conversations about what rights they actually have from an economic standpoint, which is actually still being worked out. Right now, as we speak, the NFL and the NFL Players Association is trying to come to terms on what will happen if, let's say, there are games that are canceled or players don't feel comfortable participating for a variety of reasons, including that they may have family members who are predisposed. Uh, so these are the types of considerations, but also for, I'd say, the more economically advantaged players, does it make sense to forfeit a year? Does it make sense to forfeit 
what anyone else outside of sports would look at as an exorbitant salary, but in the grand scheme of things, it may not be as, as important to them as a percentage of their overall uh, income that they receive throughout their lifetime or throughout their careers. Uh, and then otherwise, for players who may be coming up on free agency, that's another consideration. Do you risk it or do you wait and, and become a free agent and negotiate a much larger deal? So a variety of considerations for athletes. I don't talk to them as their agent. Uh, I actually work with a lot of sports agents and it would be a conflict for me, but I oftentimes do speak to them as their legal counsel because they trust me. Shifting gears a little bit, Darren, uh, there's been a lot happening recently with the name of the Washington football team. Uh, and you're representing a client who's involved in at one level of that controversy. Um, can you give us uh, a bit of a perspective given your proximity to that uh, name change situation and what some of the legal and business considerations that might fall out of that name change? Well, so uh, I have the unique opportunity of serving as legal counsel for Mr. Martin McCauley who has filed uh, over 40 Washington related trademarks over the past five, six years. In fact, he started this obsession or hobby roughly five, six years ago when he applied to register, um, I think it was Washington Americans and also Washington Red Tailed Hawks and received registrations for those trademark applications. He applied for them, I believe, initially on an intent to use basis ultimately showed use in commerce in connection with the goods and services that he applied for and received registrations. Uh, so kudos to him for that. And much more recently, when it became evident that Washington, the NFL team was going to change its name away from the Redskins and rebrand, uh, he then filed many more applications. And I was not part of that process whatsoever. It was only afterwards. And in fact, I had provided quite a bit of commentary on and I was somewhat guilty, as were many other people, of judging a book by its cover. And I actually wrote about this in a column that I do at AboveTheLaw.com, explaining why I decided to represent the individual that at first I, I viewed as probably just being a trademark troll. And so I actually had him on my Instagram Live. We had a discussion where I asked him a ton of questions, and then we continued that conversation offline. And I learned that this is not a trademark troll. As I mentioned, this is an individual who had a hobby, was actually using these intent to use applications in commerce, had a few registrations, and currently has an intent to use uh, many of the applications that he has applied for recently. And so July 3 comes, the team says it's starting a thorough review to determine whether or not it will change its team name. I believe it was July 13th or whereabouts where it said the review is ongoing, but at the culmination of the review, we have decided we will change the name. Now, we don't know what the name is going to be. Uh, in speaking with Mr. McCauley, we've decided, look, first of all, I found out that he had previously uh, emailed the NFL saying, I have all these trademarks. You want them? Take them for free. In fact, he went as far to say, I mean, do I have to pay you to take the trademarks off my hand, which I thought was really funny. <laughs> So the problem that I saw is that when we started talking and more and more press developed, here was an individual who was absolutely what you would consider a private individual. And overnight he was thrust into the public spotlight where now he basically was a public figure. And here was an individual who had maybe published two tweets in six years and all of a sudden felt compelled to tweet 300 times mainly in response and in defense of what he was doing because he was receiving so many threats and a lot of harassment. And he asked me to represent him. He asked if I would help detract from some of that. And so I released a letter on Twitter, sent it out to the Washington NFL team. And uh, you know, a lot of that negative attention that he was receiving was, I guess, redirected to me. And he liked that. He was very happy. And he remains happy about that. And I can take it. I've got thick skin. So, but his story continues to be told. And I think a lot of people now at least understand that he's not a profiteer. He's not out there who's just applying for all these names because he's looking for a payday. Um, you know, if, if, the, if the Washington NFL team in the past would have offered it to him, I don't think he'd reject it. I don't think any of us would have, but that's not his goal. It, it seems like 
people who maybe just read the headline assumed that there was this trademark trolling happening and and some profiteering as you as, as you mentioned at, at this point in the, the the journey what is he hoping to see come out of this this situation and is is selling the trademark or even giving the trademark a free, for free uh, at odds with what he was hoping to to use the trademarks for for his own commercial purpose I can only speak based on my own understanding. And again, I wasn't involved in the actual ac application process, but what he has told me is that to the extent that he's in the way, it was always his intention to one, preclude others from serving as trolls so that if the Washington NFL team was interested in any one of his names, that he could just divest it to them, that he could either transfer the registration or remove an application. Uh, and two, that he has absolutely no qualms whatsoever with either abandoning uh, a pending application uh, or assigning the right title and interest to an existing registration. So uh, what is his interest now? As I mentioned, um, he really goes into this without any expectation or demand for money. Uh, what he has asked for in the past week or so is that if the NFL team is interested in any of his marks, uh, that it makes a charitable contribution to a Native American tribe or to, to multiple ones. Um, and so, uh, look, I mean, that's the type of guy that I was happy to, to take on as a client. It's not a huge money maker for me. I, I think it's funny. Uh, I, I've asked him many times to stop doing this, but he goes on the record nonstop with these publications like, I hired this $400 an hour attorney uh, to handle my record. I'm like, oh, please, like, stop. Um, you know, you can say you hired an attorney and you can mention my name if you'd like, but let's, let's, let's stop with uh, putting my <laughs> hourly fee out there for everyone. To... Let's turn our discussion to college athletes. Uh, you're very vocal about the need for change when it comes to college athletes being fairly compensated for the use of their names and images and likenesses by schools and by the NCAA. Uh, for those of us that aren't totally familiar with the nuances of this issue. Can you walk us through the, the headlines of what you're passionate about here and, and where you'd like to see things change over the coming years? Sure. So when we're talking about names, images, and likenesses, we're talking at, at its core publicity rights, which derive from privacy rights. And many states have statutes on their books that afford for specific rights of publicity and an opportunity for individuals to sue when their rights of publicity are misappropriated for commercial gain by others. In those states that don't have statutes on the books, it's basically common law. But these are rights that every individual throughout the United States enjoys, except for college athletes. So it's something that I've been following for many, many years and writing about for many years. I've, I used to write for Forbes uh, for six years. I wrote for Eve Magazine for four. Uh, I've owned a website, Sports Agent Blog, for 15, oh, coming on 15 years now. And it's always been a subject that was near and dear to my heart, that I thought these were rights that college athletes absolutely deserve. And the rights came at no harm to the universities nor to the NCAA, but the NCAA has always been so damn stubborn to not allow these athletes to have those rights. In fact, it's written right in the bylaws to preclude college athletes from having these rights. And just very recently, there was a uh, hearing on Capitol Hill in the Senate Judiciary Committee where you had uh, Mark Emmert, the president of the NCAA, testify. Uh, you had uh, an athletic director from Clemson testify and many others. And so we don't, right now, we don't know whether the NCAA, the federal government, the power of big five conferences will do anything about naming change the rules at all from a national landscape. The NCAA at one point in time, not very long ago said, under no circumstances are these rights going to be afforded to college athletes. That it'd be akin to opening Pandora's box, that the NCAA was concerned that all of a sudden the athletes would be classified as employees, which they're not currently, and get all these other benefits and rights. And that was the biggest concern for the NCAA. Well, all it took was three states to pass legislation and uh, have the respective governors sign it into law for the NCAA to do an about face. It started with California. California passed what was originally called the Pay to Play Act. It's been rebranded. 
it uh, would allow college athletes within the state's borders to start commercializing and make money off of their names, images, and likenesses as of 2023. Colorado has, fo has followed suit, essentially passing and signing into law the same legislation as what was adopted in California, effective 2023. My state of Florida has been a bit more aggressive, and that's where I've been a large part of it. Back in, at the end of 2019, I was asked to be a part of the drafting and promotional process creating a new piece of legislation, perhaps built off the back of what was uh, established in California, but with nuances. And I, I started working with Representative Chip Lamarca's office. He's a representative for my district in the state of Florida House of Representatives. And we had a, a, a template bill ready for the start of the legislative session in 2020, which started January. It went through a couple of committees in the House of Representatives, ultimately landing on the House floor and passing. There was uh, another piece of legislation proposed by another uh, individual in the House, uh, which was really a mirror image of California's bill. Ultimately, it was our bill uh, that passed the House and went to the Senate. Again, went through a couple of committees. And the big issue at, at the final stage of the debate in the Senate was when will it become effective? Obviously we knew about California 2023. I don't think Colorado was signed into law yet, but we knew about it 2023. Originally, we were super aggressive uh, with Chip Lamarca. We had an effective date of July, 2020. So in essence, if our original bill was passed and signed into law, it would be effective as we talk today. I would say that it's a fortunate occurrence that that, didn't, that wasn't the case. We could have not accounted for COVID-19. Uh, and I don't think there still would have been enough runway for us to establish criteria in addition to the legislation. So the Senate argued strongly for an effective date of July 2021, which is included in the final bill, which was signed into law by Governor DeSantis in June of this year. Why June? Typically, the, the, the House and the Senate meet for three months in the beginning of the year. And after a bill is passed, the governor has a couple of weeks to either sign it, veto it, or it automatically gets entered into law. Well, because of COVID-19, everything was tabled. And so we waited until June, and that's when it was signed into law. So imagine if we still had that July 2020 effective date, there would have only been about less than a month of runway to figure out what the specific rules and regulations will be above and beyond what we passed in the state of Florida. Uh, but it, it's been a very exciting journey. There's so much I can talk about on this specific matter. We can go for hours. Uh, and there's so much still being done to try to make this a national effort. And hopefully that happens. And hopefully they use a lot of what we've included within our Florida bill uh, to their advantage. It, with the momentum that you're seeing build in a, a couple of states here, do, do you feel like making this nationwide will just be a, a natural progression that will happen over uh, hopefully a fairly rapid time frame? Logical people would say so. That's a natural progression. There are over 30 states that are now looking at similar legislation. I wouldn't be surprised if by July 2021, the majority of those states have passed and signed into laws that are similar to any of the three states that have already signed into law this type of legislation. I also wouldn't be surprised if California and Colorado relook at their laws and decide, hey, we need to bump up our effective date. If we're 2023 and Florida's 2021, that's two years of advantage provided to Florida schools. And we wanna be on a level playing field. I think the NCAA would be wise to understand that it needs to give up a lot of its power and control. Uh, it needs to get off of its high horse and demand an antitrust exemption in order for there to be real national change. Uh, but I never have too much faith in the NCAA. Meanwhile, the federal government, look, it, it is inundated with much more important issues. Uh, it dealt with the President Trump impeachment trial. It dealt, it, dealt with and is dealing with COVID-19 and everything surrounding that from an economic standpoint and otherwise. There's an election coming up this year. So I'm not that confident that Congress will jump on this and get something passed and signed into law before July 2021, despite efforts of Marco Rubio and otherwise. Um, so it's sort of a wait and see. But 
I can tell you here in Florida, we're ready to move forward July 2021, even if it means that we're the only state that's offering it to college athletes. The, the, the premise for why we did this is simply to provide the, these rights to college athletes that they deserve. It wasn't to provide some sort of recruiting advantage to colleges. Are we naive to believe that colleges in the state of Florida will have that advantage? No. But again, the core issue is these are rights that should have never been taken away from college athletes. So Darren, you've, with your, your practice built up a, a pretty significant uh, social media following, uh, you, you've got almost, I think, 40,000 followers on, on Twitter. And you talked earlier about uh, running Instagram videos. And it seems like you've built up a, a real social media presence. Uh, you, you blog. T tell us about what you've done to help build up your uh, your social media presence over the years and maybe how that's helped build your practice as a result? Well, I think first and foremost, it's important to note that this didn't happen overnight. This was built up over a long time. And my law firm now, Heitner Legal, which I started in June 2014, is technically the third law firm that I've worked at. Fortunately, I worked at law firms that were small, entrepreneurial, and allowed me to build my own brand while I was there. I think absent that opportunity, it would have been difficult to start my own law firm. Um, and so that is certainly a big reason, just getting after something for a long amount of time. And then also hyper-focusing on a specific area. Early on, I decided I was going to do my best to brand myself as a sports and entertainment lawyer. And I would say it's worked absolutely as a great advantage for me because not to toot my own horn, but I believe at this point in time, I'm on a very short list of lawyers when athletes, agents, et cetera, are looking for uh, counsel to assist them on the transactional and IP litigation and so on and so forth. Uh, but I guess it also worked in a different way to pigeonhole myself in a way that I have to work hard to rebrand myself now to explain to people, I'm not just a sports and entertainment lawyer. With regard to the followings that I've uh, amassed, let's say on Twitter, for instance, you mentioned my followers. Again, I'm, I'm hyper-focused. I, I decided 15 years ago when I started Sports Agent Blog that I was going to provide information to the masses that they weren't really receiving. There was no repository for sports agent-related news, yet there's a lot of people who are very intrigued by the profession and sports business as a whole. And so I was able to really, if I'm focusing primarily on that with sprinkles in here and there of sunsets and my wife and I having a good time and eating different things, um, showing a little bit of character, but staying true to who I am and, and what, I what I practice on primarily, it's allowed me to really build that following uh, and keep the quality over the quantity. You know, a big, a big differentiating factor for me and my law firm uh, is communication. And I think starting my practice in a time where there's such ease to communicate with clients, third parties, et cetera, has been such a huge advantage. And I say right on my website, you respond you know, very quickly, you're transparent, you keep me involved with the case. Who doesn't walk around with a phone at all times? And we're always connected. So I give my clients my cell phone. We text each other, we WhatsApp each other, we email each other, we FaceTime each other, we you know, tweet each other. I mean, it, it just that connectivity is something that the clients really appreciate, especially when they are paying a premium for legal services. And I think that's really what's allowed me to separate my firm from a lot of the competition. And on that note, Darren, your law firm's slogan is love your, or I love my lawyer, um, which, which is a, a pretty high bar, having your clients walk around saying, I, I love my lawyer. I, I love that. And it certainly resonates me, uh, as you know, uh, myself and, and Cleo in general, we really believe in the concept of being client-centered and uh, everything you just talked about in terms of thinking about different modalities of communication with your clients, staying in touch, uh, really engaging with them strongly resonates really deeply with me. When you, when you think about holistically how you approach building your client experience, can you tell, tell me about some other things you do to, to really hopefully have the outcome that after an interaction with you, your, your clients are walking away saying, I love my lawyer? Absolutely. Um, you know, the I love my lawyer came about when one of my clients uh, created a t-shirt. Uh, it's a nutritional supplement company that said, I love pre-workout. 
And then they're like, well, what if we create, I love my lawyer shirts. We love our lawyer. And they just sent me a bunch of them. So I gave them to different clients. And now it's sort of become a thing amongst clients. I always get like comments on Facebook or Instagram from clients who just say, I love my lawyer. And, um, it, it's sort of changing the dynamic of, of what a typical uh, client lawyer relationship looks like. I mean, by and large, the general public abhors lawyers. And let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, that's true. And we need to do something as a community to change that. And certainly it's something that I have focused on. It's making sure that clients understand primarily we are in a business relationship, but that doesn't preclude us from also having a personal relationship. And some of my closest friends started off as clients. One of my closest friends who was a groomsman of mine uh, was my very first origination my very first client 10 years ago and you know i tell my clients look we can never allow us to mix business and pleasure but there's no reason why we can't have that business relationship and have a separate personal relationship you know it, it's evolved to the extent that i had a client who was so happy with the services provided that he decided to buy space in times square and put our branding on the digital ads in Times wow. Square with my lawyer. And I had, I had colleagues and friends like, well, why don't you just tell your, your colleague to give that money to you? And I'm like, well, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, I, I don't think I generated any, any true value from that, but it was just a cool experience. And so, you know, I don't view myself as just a lawyer as well. When there's an opportunity to either connect a client with another client or connect a client with a different type of business opportunity, that really has nothing to do with the practice of law, I do it. Even if I'm not billing for it, it doesn't matter because the clients are going to appreciate that. And there's nothing better than a referral from a happy client. Because yeah. when, a cl when a happy client says to somebody else, Darren, Alan, Heitner Legal did a great job for me, what, what, what more can I ask for? So it's, it's really great. I mean, you know, we, we kind of joke around with the whole I love my lawyer concept, but it's, it's evolved into something bigger than I expected for sure. Yeah, well, that's great. And that's such a powerful flywheel to build for your business when you have people leaving an interaction with you, recommending others, referring others to your, your business. And, and maybe to conclude, Darren, I'm, I'm curious, you alluded to this earlier, but maybe this this tension between, you know, being very specialized in some areas you, you mentioned, you positioned yourself originally as a sports and entertainment lawyer. You handle some very uh, so-called niche practice areas like cyber squatting and esports, and, and gaming and right of publicity law. Uh, but you also don't want to get pigeonholed in, into some of these, these practice areas as well. So can you tell us maybe how you've helped navigate uh, making those specializations uh, an advantage, but but not something that overly restricts the clients you might be able to take on? It's a challenge. It's always about education. And I think it's very impractical to educate everybody in the, uh, in, in the whole universe as to what it is that we do, which is beyond some of those niche specialties. Uh, but when a client may contact me uh, and ask, you know, I have this breach a contract dispute in a construction case. Uh, I see you're a sports lawyer. Can you help me? I'm like, yeah, I mean, we, we've handled those types of issues before and I'll provide uh, examples without divulging any sort of attorney client privilege. And again, it's just about really educating uh, consumers. And uh, you know, I try to do so primarily online, whether it be through the website, whether it be through social media or otherwise. And then also, obviously, I mean, it, it helps to uh, focus on your surroundings. So to the extent that I'm able to get out there in the Miami-Dade, Broward County, Palm Beach County area uh, and, and grow my practice through uh, you know, individuals who surround me, that's, that's another priority of mine. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a work in progress, and I think it will always be a work in progress. I have no regrets about branding, hyper-branding myself in the sports entertainment con. Uh, context. Fantasy sports, I mean, has been an amazing area of growth for us. Sports betting, um, you know, esports, as you mentioned. So I love that. And I can survive with just those niches alone. But in terms of how I would like to grow, I think that there are a lot of things that translate to other areas. And I just need to do a better job of educating the public. 
Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Darren. I really enjoyed our conversation and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider, for supporting this podcast.